morning. Jenlene, who's wearing a very nice hat today, <laughs> which everybody lazy should, cat? the lazy cat hat, <laughs> exactly. If you are, oh, and the camera inverted, let's see. Okay, if you are joining us for the very first time today, welcome to our learning community. A year and a half ago, uh, Jenlene and I moved back to the United States, left academia and started teaching online. I'm going to be hosting the coming hour. Jenlene is just here vibing with us. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much for that. If you are joining us for the very first time, welcome. Um, we have students from so many. Oh, we're actually not live right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have to go live again. We lost the connection. <laughs> I like that. We're going to do it twice. Okay. <laughs> On YouTube, everybody. This is going to be the second time around <laughs> that we do it. Okay. Let's see if it works this time. Checking connection. I'm in suspense. We'll see. Hello and good morning, everybody. This is me, Julian. And to my left, we have Deneline. And I'm going to show Deneline's hat again <laughs> because I want everybody to see the lazy cat hat. There we go. Um, if you're joining us for the very first time today, hello and welcome. Um, a year and a half ago, I started teaching these classes online for free, open access for anybody who wants to join. We have students from around the world, which makes me very, very happy. Mm -hmm. It is a dark, cold, <laughs> autumnal morning. Um, it is 8 a.m. here in the United States um, on the West Coast. So thank you for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm. Jenlene's going to be here vibing with us, and we're going to spend an hour delving into various philosophical theories. If you are a beginner, that's totally fine. Uh, every class is designed as an introduction, as a standalone experience. Um, however, if you are a longtime student, hello, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you for posting in the comments where you are joining us from. In fact, it always makes me very happy when people post in the comments mm -hmm. the, um, the countries that you guys are joining us from. It makes us feel very connected to the world, which yes. is wonderful. I'm, I'm always amazed all the countries people join us from. It's just absolutely wild. Mm -hmm. um, and also a big thank you to our patrons. Our patrons are the ones who keep these classes going for free. Our patrons help us finance these classes for everybody else. Um, so a big, big thank you to our patrons. You guys are wonderful and incredible. And yes, I like that people are posting in the comments where you're from. <laughs> India, France, Brazil, Philippines. That's <laughs> wonderful. That is honestly the greatest gift you could give me. Mm -hmm. Joining live from Sweden, Athens, Greece. Uh, <laughs> that's really, really wonderful. Yes. Santa Cruz, California. Um, that's close, actually. It'd be funny if someone's like <laughs> joining you from the back seat, and That'd it's be like, the Halloween episode. yeah, the, ah! <laughs> it's like I'm right behind you. <laughs> um, okay, so I just want to say very quickly, uh, I like the North Germany. That's excellent. <laughs> not 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 the decadent South, not Munich <laughs> or Bavaria. Okay, but here's the thing. Um, I have an announcement to make, which is that I'm going to be releasing a book next week, end of October, October 31st, I mm -hmm. think. I'm never sure if there's 31 days in a month. <laughs> it's like I look at my knuckles and I start going. <laughs> October 31st, I'm going to be releasing a book on Patreon called The Hermeneutic Temptation. And the book summarizes all of the lectures that I've been hosting here for the past 10 weeks. So if you would like to read a version of that that has been properly written out and edited. Um, you can find that on my Patreon. The book is going to be released exclusively to Patreons October 31st. It's going to be called The Hermeneutic Temptation. I'm going to be posting some more ads for that this, this week so that people know about it. And yeah, our top tier patrons will be able to download that book and share it with anybody anybody they like. In fact, somebody already reached out to me and said that they'd like to do a translation, uh, which is amazing. If you would like to do a translation of the book, um, I'm happy to send you a free copy because that's an enormous amount of work. <laughs> and I appreciate that. That's a true labor of love. So um, of course, if you also just want to be sneaky and you want to get a free copy, you could say something like, I want to translate it into Hungarian, in, in which case, sure. Sure, that's fine. So that's coming October 31st. The Hermeneutic Temptation is going to be released as an ebook to um, to our patrons. Mm -hmm. So take a look on Patreon. There's a link in my bio or go to www.patreon.com dash. Jenlene and Julian. That's right. Jenlene and Julian. <laughs> All right. So let's just sort of launch right in. Is that okay? Just yeah, go for, go it. for it. I want to say like a big congratulations on being super. I know that Julian is not like... Um, stressed about um, finishing the book because mm. he had time to choose a very nice cover <laughs> and title. And anyone who has time to, you know, 
go through different fonts and you know kind of imagine how it'll be as someone who is not so stressed so i gotta say congratulations it's it's funny <laughs> because um this is we should talk more about this in the behind the scenes but when I was an academic, I actually released a, an academic book, which was based on my PhD, is what they call a monograph. And um, that book, I had to choose a cover, but the marketing department kept coming back to me saying that my covers weren't suitably marketable. <laughs> and could I please find a cover that was like sexier? <laughs> And now I don't have to do that. Now I can just choose a cover that I like that is totally not sexy because our patrons support support the non-sexy process. Um, uh, someone says you'd love to translate into Portuguese. Giro, that would be amazing. Um, just get in touch with me via DM if you're interested in working on translation. Um, but honestly, I don't want to like make you guys do unpaid labor. So like, this is not, I'm not asking people to do this. Okay, let's start with the class. And what do I mean by the hermeneutic temptation? Um, because it's sort of like a mouthful. And so I want to spend an hour trying to give you an introduction into what I mean by the hermeneutic temptation and why we should resist the hermeneutic temptation. Um, but I want to start with something totally not philosophical. There's a specific type of video that exists on the internet. Call it a self-help video. In which... And there's numerous versions of these types of videos in which somebody says something like this. They say that the reason that you are poor, the reason that you remain poor is because you didn't learn how to become rich. And that the difference between you being poor and the rich being wealthy is that the rich have access to specialized knowledge. And that if only you had access to that knowledge, you too could be rich. In other words, that if you have the secret of wealth, you could rise up from the ranks of poverty into the privileges of wealth. Usually this is followed by some kind of pitch to buy something. <laughs> I will sell you the secret. Or it's something like, it's something about learning how to deal with money, how you should cut out your friends and your family and invest, etc. Like there's, there's this idea that there's this secret that the rich have. And the rich are keeping this secret from you. And that if only you had that secret, you could rise up into the ranks of the rich and famous and wealthy. It's sort of a common trope, whether it's blogs or, I don't know, um, videos into, or TikTok videos. If you go into any used bookstore, there's always going to be a huge section of financial self-help. That's one of the perennial genres of yeah. publishing. Yeah. And, and so I'm not trying to make fun of this, but I want to focus a little bit more on how this process works and what it tells us about what I would call the hermeneutic temptation. Um, there's actually a joke. I've mentioned this before. There's a joke that Zizek uses, and it's a seemingly simple joke. But as with most of Zizek's jokes, there's a lot of theory hidden beneath the cracks here. And the joke is about a Polish man, an anti-Semitic Polish man, who encounters a Jew in a train carriage. And the Polish man sort of anti-Semitically looks at the Jew with his preconception, his prejudice, that the Jew is inherently knows how to be wealthy because, you know, the Jews control all the wealth, etc. That's his anti-Semitism. He projects that onto the Jew. And then he says, because you Jews know how to make money, I want you to teach me. Instead of hating you, I'm going to be a good anti-Semite, and I want to learn the secret of you Jews, how you become so wealthy. And, and there's something very marvelously humorous that the, Jew, the Jewish man does in this case, which is that, hey, there's actually someone from Poland in the comments. Excellent. It's funny, a lot of those Zizek jokes have Polish people as like the butt of the joke in this case, which is, I mean, it's a historical, uh, it's a historical explanation for that. Anyway, so the Jewish man and the Polish man are sitting in the train. And the Polish man says, I want you to teach me the secret of how you Jews become so rich. And the Jewish man says, okay, sure. I'll teach you how we become so rich, but you have to give me some money. And so the Polish man gives him a little bit of money and the Jewish man starts speaking. After five minutes, he says, please give me some more money and I will give you more information. He starts speaking. After five minutes, he says, I need another... For more five minutes, I need more money. Essentially like a wisdom slot machine. <laughs> At a certain point, the Polish man 
sort of goes into an anti-Semitic rage and he says, ah, I can see what you're doing. You're not telling me the secret of how to become rich. You just want more of my money. See, I knew it. I should have known that Jewish people are just tricksters who want to deprive us of our wealth, etc. right? And so he goes into this anti-Semitic tirade, at which point the Jew, the Jewish guy leans back and says, see, there you have my answer. That is the secret. And what's so clever, I mean, I'm not very good at telling this joke, but what's so clever about this joke is actually the anti-Semitic element in it, which is that it's precisely because the Polish man remains stuck in the anti-Semitic trope that the Jew has the secret that it's used against him. That's what's so clever about the Jewish response. And the funny thing is that when the Polish man reacts angrily, he says, I was the nice guy who thought that even though I'm anti-Semitic, I wanted to know what's the real secret. In other words, secretly the Polish guy, and this is like the deeper point here, secretly the Polish guy had his anti-Semitism but didn't really believe in it. In other words, he didn't really believe that the Jew was rich just because of tricks. He genuinely thought that there was a secret behind the anti-Semitic facade of being the Jew that he could somehow mine into. Mm -hmm. And so what the Jew weaponizes, the Jewish guy weaponizes against him is precisely his belief that he is not truly anti-Semitic. In other words, that I'm not explaining this very well, but essentially the anti-Semitic idea is this. You are rich because you are Jewish. And yet the anti-Semitic guy secretly believes that behind that, there is a true secret. And so he wants to pierce behind that true secret. And then the Jewish guy flips it on him and basically says, no, it is just because I'm Jewish and I trick, <laughs> trick you. It's something very clever that happens here. It has something to do with appearance. And it has something to do with the Lacanian theory of appearance, an appearance and illusion. Lacan basically says this, and I'm going to spend more time with examples trying to explain what it means. Lacan says that appearance is never when you're just trying to hide something. Appearance is never just when you're trying to hide a secret. Instead, appearance is when you're trying to hide the fact that there is no secret. When the conspiracy isn't to say, I'm keeping something from you. When the conspiracy is to say, I am suggesting that there is something that is being kept from you, which is a very, it's a very small but very important difference. In one case, you have something to hide. In the second case, the thing that you have to hide is that there is nothing to hide. And that's what Lacan calls appearance. Mm -hmm. Now, Lacan is a really interesting example of this. And some of the longtime students here may already know the example. It's the artistic battle between Zeuxis and Parasios, between Zeuxis and Parasios from antiquity. And it is a battle of artistic deception. Now, what do I mean by that? The two artists, Zeuxis and Parasios, set themselves a challenge. And the challenge is to paint a picture that is so convincingly real that the other person will be tricked into thinking that it is not an artistic depiction, but reality itself. And the challenge that they set themselves is that they're going to paint grapes. They're going to paint, I don't know, like, what do we call that? A, a bunch of grapes. A bunch of grapes. Thank you. <laughs> a bunch of grapes. The technical term. <laughs> they're going to paint a bunch of grapes. And so Zeuxis paints grapes that are so marvelously realistic. So just tantalizingly fresh looking that even the birds come and start pecking at the picture. It's like <laughs> photorealism. It's the height of classical art. And Zeuxis thinks to himself, I've made the perfect fake, the authentic fake. And Parasios will never be able to beat this. And then he goes to visit Parasios and says, okay, Parasios, you've seen my painting. Now I want to see yours. And he walks into Parasios' studio and he sees a curtain and he walks up to the curtain and he says, aha, now I want to see your picture and bumps into the painting. In other words, Parasios didn't paint the grapes. Parasios simply painted a realistic looking curtain. And it's because Zeuxis thought that the real grapes or the fake real grapes were behind the curtain 
that he lost the game. In other words, what Parasios knew is what Lacan knew about appearance. The most genuine fake isn't to say, I've made the perfect copy. The most genuine fake is to say, I've made the most perfect copy of the thing that is keeping you from it. In other words, Parasios was more convincing because he tricked the other person into thinking that the real grapes were behind the curtain. Okay, so it's a wonderful story, and I think that like we can use it to elaborate a little bit more. Um, but I want to make a leap here into another example, because we're talking about appearance here. Yesterday night, I watched a movie, and this movie uh, won the Oscar for Best Screenplay last year. The movie is called Promising Young Woman, and it stars Carrie Mulligan and Bo Burnham. And Carrie Mulligan, uh, I'm not, well, I suppose I'll just have spoilers for this movie. Whatever. (laughs) It's called Promising Young Woman. And the film is essentially a revenge fantasy, but it's more clever than that. It's a revenge fantasy where a woman has a friend, and that friend was uh, raped, was sexually uh, abused, and her friend has committed suicide. And now the surviving friend is on a mission to hunt down all of the participants in that sexual episode of sexual violence and take revenge on them. And what's so cruel and beautiful and interesting about this movie is that every single one of the men in Promising Young Woman, every single one of the sexual predators are bona fide Nice guys. <laughs> None of them are, oh, I'm the evil sexual predator. All of them present themselves as nice guys. You were nodding here? Mm-hmm. Is it just, yeah. you see where I'm going, right? <laughs> yeah. And one of the, and without going into detail about the movie, of course, Bo Burnham is the ultimate nice guy in the movie. What happens in the movie is that it's not saying there are some nice men who do horrible things. It's that the only way to commit horrible acts of sexual violence is precisely because you think you are the nice guy. It's not that some nice guys commit bad acts. It's that all bad acts are only ever committed by nice guys. That's the horrific insight that the movie leads you to, um, in a sense. And so what's important here is that it's not that you have the let's say, the good guy who makes the mistake or the bad guy who does something evil, it's that the evil situation of sexual violence and abuse occurs specifically under the appearance of I'm just a nice guy. Didn't you see I was just trying to take care of you, etc., etc. And so here we have actually, in that movie, two Hegelian concepts, two really good ways of understanding Hegel, both of which are concepts that Slavoj Žižek has popularized. One of them is the Hegelian idea of the beautiful soul. The other one is that of, you could call it Hegel's theory of evil. And um, both of them can be related to that observation. For Hegel, the beautiful soul is somebody who looks around them in the world and essentially wants to project their own moral agenda or their own moral perspective on other people. In other words, what I do to be happy, what I do to be healthy, what I do to be just, would be true for everybody else as well. It's like this devious twist on the maxim that, you know, do unto others as you would do to yourself, is to say, here's what I do for me, and so that should work for you. Now, the way that Zizek interprets that is he says that the Hegelian beautiful soul is essentially the liberal humanist today. The person who says that my experience as a white, relatively well-educated young young male should be the experience of everybody else. But, and this is what what Zizek doesn't quite see here, which is fine, is that the beautiful soul is precisely linked to the idea of Hegel's theory of evil. And here's why. The beautiful soul sees in their very acts of violence an injustice against themselves. This is beautifully depicted in in, in Promising Young Woman, where when the man commits an act of violence in the movie, often cases of extreme violence, including sexual violence and murder, the man immediately will go into like a pitiful state where he has to be comforted by other men. And he says, this is not your fault. 
you were put in a bad situation, the woman was the one who was tempting you, and so on and so forth. And so here we have already the link between the Hegelian idea of the beautiful soul, it's not my fault, the other person put me in this position, she had it coming, etc., versus Hegel's theory of evil, which is that evil resides in the gaze that sees evil everywhere. In other words, evil is not the act of doing bad things, Evil is thinking that you are good and that the other person is bad. Evil is a form of righteousness wherein which good perceives itself as being, in a sense, infallible. And so to really do evil is to commit yourself to the idea that you are good and that the other person is in the wrong. It's also why the most atrocious and evil acts are never committed under the auspices of, oh, I'm going to be evil, but precisely under I'm going to be good. Think about the Crusades, for example. The Crusades are the perfect example. The Crusades weren't to say, we're going to bring a rule of terror to the world. No, the Crusades were brought as, we're going to liberate the world from the tyranny of quote-unquote Islam. Look at the invasion of Iraq. The invasion of Iraq was presented precisely as the liberation of women from oppression. The same was true in Afghanistan. We are going to free women from the Taliban, etc. And so women, rather than being actual agents in this cause, become the, in a sense, the, um, uh, like the, the it, indivisible remainder of that drive towards doing good. And of course, to go back to Promising Young Woman, what's so, what's so terrifying and what's so sad about that movie is that it understands perfectly that that is how the evil of these men works, is that they are convinced that they are the good guys and that the women are the ones who have corrupted them and that these cycles perpetuate in that way. It's pretty heavy stuff for a Monday morning. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it reminded me of something that I read about a while ago that I thought was really interesting, that um, during the pandemic, there was a concern about how... Um, services for domestic violence, um, let's say victims and their relatives and community could be supported. And the UK had like a pilot program mm. uh, where people could call in and talk about their experience. And something like 85, okay. something like 85% of the callers were men or people who had been the let's say, the perpetrators of domestic violence. And what was so surprising about it was that they were trying to make sense of their behavior and action. Mm -hmm. And having a system that could say, you're not an evil person, you've done something really bad, and here's how we can figure out how to get you the counseling services that you need was really was really important. Because the stereotype, I mean, my prejudice would have been that it would primarily be victims of domestic mm -hmm. violence calling, and that would predominantly be women. So I just thought... Yeah. That it's, was really unexpected to me, yeah. Well, it's funny to see men in this case looking for reassurance that they are, in fact, the true victims. Okay. And there's a scene in the movie where one of the men confronts, is having a confrontation with, with the woman, and he says that, don't you see that the worst thing that could ever happen to a man is to be accused of sexual assault? And she's like, have you thought about what the worst thing is that could happen to a woman? <laughs> anyway, I don't want to make it a whole yeah. thing about this, yeah. but... Um, no, the movie really, really well illustrates. Oh, okay. thank you. You're very welcome. Oh, no, I thought you were eating it. Sorry. No, I was going to save it. No, you're saving it. For <laughs> snacks. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the point here, the larger point I'm trying to make is that part of appearance is that it always takes place as its perceived opposite. That the conditions under which evil takes place is the assumption that you are acting from a place of good. And vice versa, that often the place from which good acts stem secretly have an underlying evil or selfish implication. And, and I want to keep that, that thought in mind for a moment. Um, and this is something that one of the problems that I have with Buddhism, or at least Buddhism, how it's sort of neutered into Western practice. Um, it's the idea that we can experience emotions or experiences in general in life as being unaffected by this kind of disavowal or this kind of repression where an appearance hides its opposite. The idea that we have a direct exchange between positive emotions and negative emotions. Mm -hmm. I was reading about a museum exhibit where um, the idea was that people would go into the museum and um, they would do things like um, get rid of negative emotions. And one of them was that they would grab a gong and um, 
uh, well, there's a gong and they would grab like whatever the thing is you hit the gong with. Mm -hmm. They would take a negative emotion into their mind. They would hit the gong and then the gong would be submersed in water so that the sound would ring out and then become subdued. And then the idea is that you've gone into the museum and you've released your negative energy and you've transferred it into something else. And this is like where I'm a very sick individual, I think, is that for me, I have this perverse pleasure immediately to imagine that that's exactly how the promising young woman works, which is I'm a man, I have negative energy. And then I met this woman and I took advantage of her. But now I've transferred my negative energy into something beautiful, which was sexual intercourse with this partner. Like it's it's a distinctly mm -hmm. like creepy dynamic to me that mm -hmm. you could take a negative emotion and transform it into a positive emotion through some like new supposedly neutral object like the gong. Yeah, and this idea that that our life can only can be fixed if only we could get rid of all of our negativity, yeah. then we would somehow be better rather than seeing negativity as a force for change in the world rather than just, oh, I just need to push it away. And if only I could yeah. adequately push it away, then my life would be perfect. And well, it's, it's yeah. the idea that if you're angry, sometimes there's actually a good reason that you're angry. Um, but but more than that. From a Freudian perspective, mm. anger and love, for example, aren't just separated. It's not that love is an absence of anger. It's that anger is often a form of like repressed content of love. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, first of all, it's also, of course, sad why it's precisely people you love that you end up hurting. Because if you don't love people, you're not particularly interested in hurting them, right? Plus, if you don't love them, you probably can't really hurt them. This is the irony about couples is that the longer a couple is together, the better they become at torturing each other. Because, like, <laughs> nobody can get under your skin like the person you spend the rest of your life with. And so Freud already has this insight where Freud says that what a parent will often do is that when a parent wants attention from a child and the child is starting to grow older they realize that the child doesn't want to give them attention. It's like you say, how was school? And the child doesn't want to tell you how school was. And so the parent can no longer get attention by means of simple exchange of affection. You can't just walk up to your child and give them a hug. They're not going to want it anymore. And so the parent resorts to the second best thing, which is attention not through affection, but attention through antagonism. And so often the, the expression of, I want you to love me, comes out as nagging or doing something that you no will trigger your child so that your child then gives you attention. And so what Freud says, what's important here is that the parent has no intention of actually antagonizing the child. It's that the parent wants to be loved by the child and that's why the parent antagonizes the child, which isn't to justify abusive relationships or anything, but it's to respect the fact that emotions can't just be put into categories of positive emotions and normative negative emotions, but they're distinctly mediated by each other. And I think that's something that gets lost a little bit. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I want to sort of sort of uh, keep. So this idea of a mindset, which I think is very popular today, this idea that you can have like a positive mindset or a negative mindset and that the path towards happiness and success and fulfillment is to simply adopt a positive mindset is to my mind actually a very dangerous thing. And here's why. Um, there's a video that I saw on TikTok, which it made me feel really sad, I have to say. And I've seen a couple of videos like this. And it's a guy who says, what is the secret of being wealthy and successful? Uh, going back to what we said in the beginning of the class, what is the secret of being wealthy and successful? And he says that the secret to being wealthy, to being rich, as he puts it, is that you are always optimistic. He says, wealthy people always start the day with a smile on their face. I mean, first of all, it's ridiculous that like even someone would say this, like it's almost like an insult to po general population's intelligence. But the, the image that he then puts, and this is the part that made me sad, he said that even if you're living in poverty and you wake up and there's a cockroach under your bed, you should wake up with a smile on your face. You should manifest your life. You should, you should never stop smiling. And of course, like for me, the first thing I think about here is Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight <laughs> and the Joker. Yeah. Who goes to the like um, society, the fundraiser, the philanthropic fundraiser at like Wayne Towers and he has all these rich people there and he keeps telling and retelling the story of why he has the smile on his face and and different versions and and of course the version of of the story being that his abusive father thought that he was being too glum and that being glum was like a, not a good way to be in the world and that his that his father cut open his mouth so that he would have a perpetual smile on his face like that's the immediate resonance here 
But of course, there's something very revealing here about how capitalism works. Capitalism says, and this is where capitalism actually has a totalitarian element that is more devious than the authoritarian oppression. Capitalism says, it's not enough to know that you're oppressed. You should enjoy your own oppression. It's not enough to say that you are systematically disadvantaged. You should be grateful that you are systematically disadvantaged, that you have the opportunity to do this. We're, we're back at this idea that, you know, the only thing holding you back is your own attitude. The only thing holding you back is your own disposition. If you could pretend, like, if you could manifest your wealth, you will become wealthy. You are not someone who is poor. You are somebody, simply somebody who is not yet rich. And I think that's so pervasive. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. We that's lost okay. it, yeah. It's so pervasive for people who work in service jobs and especially like minimum wage jobs is you're told that you, you know, have to have the right attitude and you have to be happy and you have to be cheerful and you have to be smiling. And that is what maintains the illusion of it being a satisfying job. And of course, the less satisfying it is, the more you face, you know, customer harassment, the harder it is to maintain that facade if there is no dignity in that yeah, work. Yeah. Ex exactly. And we're also back precisely at the sexual violence and promising young woman, because what is it that women are told to do? Smile. Be nice. Why are you not smiling? Simply the process of a woman not trying to please is considered an insult. There's a beautiful scene in Promising Young Woman where she's walking across the street and there's three construction workers who are like doing the, you know, those crass gestures and like whistling. And she stops on the street and she just looks at them. Like she doesn't smile. She doesn't say anything. She mm -hmm. just looks at them and there's, they keep on cajoling her and then she keeps looking. And then it gets kind of creepy because it's like, why is she just not moving on? Mm -hmm. And then the guys do this beautiful thing, which is like, they slowly stop, they look at her, and then they become mad. And they start yelling at her and they say, what's wrong with you? Can't you see we're just joking? Why are you not laughing at the fact that we're just being crass? We're being, and the thing is, what's Why important here- Why don't you feel appreciated? Yeah. And Why the... can't you accept a compliment? Why can't you accept a compliment? And the important thing here for the guys again, is they're saying, oh, we're not really those kind of guys. We're playing being those types of guys, and we want you to see the performance for what it is. And all she has to do is simply short circuit the exchange, not even continue walking, just stop and just look at them. And so, and, and what's important here is there's a difference between smiling and being laughed at. Mm. This is the classic Margaret Atwood observation. You, you probably remember, uh, right? Yeah, of course, that men's biggest fear is that women will laugh at them and women's biggest fear is that men will kill them yeah and and so in a weird way the refusing to smile is already a gesture of mockery here well and that's the double power in women smiling and women laughing is that there's both the smile and the laughter as like a performative act but also as a subversive act right right yeah and giving in to the expectation right in mm -hmm. some ways yeah mm -hmm. yeah um and so we're back at this, the video that I was watching that made me sad, the TikTok video, where it said that you should simply embrace positive mindset, put a smile on your face, and no matter how bad your life is, as long as you pretend like it's a good life, you will manage to make it out, which is a distinctly abusive thing to say, and I think we can relate that to sexual politics as well mm -hmm. there. Um, so I want to briefly... <laughs> I want to briefly highlight another scene from a movie that's like a totally different movie. Could not be more different. And it's a cartoon. I think it's a Pixar cartoon that I that I saw, animated movie that I saw when I was young. It's called A Bug's Life. Have you ever seen A Bug's Life? I have, yes. And so there's a beautiful scene in The Bug's Life where there's basically the idea is that there's like a class distinction. We have the worker ants and the worker ants are being controlled by, I don't know, what are they like? A, not crickets. What do you call them? I thought they were crickets. Crickets, yeah. Grass and the hoppers, grasshoppers, crickets. thank you. Okay. And the grasshoppers are like, like the elite. They're the aristocracy. They're in the minority. And the 99% of the working ants are the, uh, are the, yeah, basically the working ants. And there's a scene in the movie where the, uh, one of the grasshoppers is making fun of the ants. And he says, ah, the ants are so puny. And, you know, they're just so silly and so dumb and so weak. And we're the naturally superior class. At which point the leader of the grasshoppers has like this big speech where he says that what you don't realize is what they don't realize, which is that they are in the majority in the movie, in the movie A Bug's Life. He says that they're in the majority 
we're in the minority. And so we have to do everything we can to prevent them from realizing that they have the power. And we have to do everything to prevent them from realizing that in an instance, they could take over power. We're the ones who are precarious and they're the ones who could easily see through that. Now, there's two things that are happening here. Two levels of interpretation. One, the obvious one, which is that the best way to keep people from not having that insight the insight that they are in fact the numeric majority, is to tell them you are one of us. You are already one of us. You may think that you are a precarious working ant, but secretly we know that you have it in you to become a grasshopper. And you are simply on the path towards becoming a grasshopper. And it's all those other suckers who haven't yet fully realized that, you know, they... (laughs) That, that they are going to be ants forever, but you're going to become a grasshopper. That's the first level of interpretation. It's the classic self-help. You're simply not rich yet. And you should never organize with the other poor people because they will keep you poor and you can simply come up to our ranks. Mm-hmm. Of course, the secondary insight there is also, I mean, sort of not the second insight, but the, you know, the B part of this is also that the powerful and the wealthy are perfectly happy to have one or two ants become success stories because then you can maintain the fantasy and the facade that all the other ants are suckers because they weren't able to pop properly manifest into wealth. And so it's much easier to just make 10 ants super rich so that you can keep the remaining 10,000 ants in squalor and say that it's their and poverty and say that it's their own fault. But here's the secondary more important part. It's not simply saying It's not simply saying, oh, you know, they have a bad mindset and some of them could become grasshoppers. Secretly, and this is where populism comes in, the best way to keep them in place is precisely to go out and tell them that they're the majority. That's how populism and reactionary politics works. You keep them in their place by selling them the idea that they're the ones in power already. And that the grasshoppers are simply the, the representatives of the people and that they embody the popular will. And then what the grasshoppers will immediately do is find the reactionary enemy, mm-hmm. something like the other insect, the Jewish insect, the foreign insect. And that's how you really control the ants. It's by the two punch combination of saying one. You don't have to be an ant. If you have a positive mindset, you can rise up to the level of being a grasshopper. And two, what's preventing you from rising up to being a grasshopper is the foreign external enemy, the enemy that we have to root out. And it's that combination that keeps the powerful in place. And so now you'll start to already realize why it is precisely in the favor of the elites to sell you the idea that there is a secret to being rich that is being kept from you somehow. As long as you keep believing that there is some secret content, you will not be able to see the properly Parisian paradox, which is that there is nothing behind being rich other than being rich. In other words, the secret to being rich is that there is no secret. The secret is that you are born into wealth. You are born into privilege. You're born into a system that structurally advantages you from the very get-go. And that's, of course, the secret, which is precisely what Lacan calls appearance. It's the fact that you are not hiding a secret. You're hiding the fact that there is no secret. And that's precisely how it works with wealth and domination. What's being hidden from you is not the secret technique or formula of how you can become wealthy. What's being hidden from you is the structural disadvantage by which you never will become wealthy. And so what's so important is specifically to make people keep on believing that they're the one who can have access to this privy information so that they too can become a grasshopper. And there's this, it's funny because I was reading an article about the masterclass company that Mm. sells masterclass videos. Uh, Like you can learn filmmaking from Martin Scorsese or I don't know, learn singing from, I don't know, Ariana Grande or something. And one of the funny things about masterclasses, first, the business works like this. 
they mostly sell to companies of workers who live <laughs> probably pretty affluent and yet quiet lives of desperation. They sell these classes to Microsoft, they sell them to Google, they sell them to like all the big companies offer masterclass packages to their employees saying that, do you feel dead in your job? Well, at the end of the day, you can go home and you can learn little nuggets of wisdom from people who are able to escape the grind. You know what I mean? And it, it, makes me, it makes me a little bit sad because the thing is, the basic premise of Masterclass isn't the transfer of knowledge or a mode of thought or a tradition of learning. It is the transfer of a single principle, which is the idea that success functions as an emulative model. In other words, that if you simply do as the successful do, you too will become successful. If you simply learn from the greatest tennis player, you will become a great tennis player. And, and what's sad here is that we're stuck precisely again in this, in this idea that there is a secret that they had that you somehow missed. That if you only knew how to hit the backhand, like, I don't know. Serena Williams. Serena Williams. Although, apparently, in the Serena Williams class, there's a beautiful nugget where she says that a good way to play against large-chested women is to play against their backhand <laughs> because they won't be able to hit it properly. That's the level of wisdom. I secretly suspect that Serena Williams is just fucking with everybody. That, like, that is, like, her wisdom. It's like the anti-master class. And so... Well, and I think that what's also sad is that what many of them, what many of those individuals are most well known for is their creativity and originality. Yeah. And the notion that there is some secret behind creativity is troubling. You can, I mean, classical music history is littered with composers who sounded like so-and-so, but are never going to be that person. So you can have composers that, you know, sound like Mozart. That's... Um, um, what's the musical? I'm blanking. <laughs> ah! <laughs> um, but is never going to be as great as Mozart because they're not Mozart. And so there are lots of, you know, composers who sound like some composer, but their history is just going to forget them. And because that's not what creativity is. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think, I mean, look, here's the thing. I like hearing insights from people I admire. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to know the process of a filmmaker I admire, like Paula Sorrentino. I think it's interesting to know what goes into starting a company or, I don't know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Process is interesting. However, it's not an emulative process. I'm not interested because I want to do that thing. And so one of the dimensions that we lose is that we don't actually realize what makes something great or what makes something creative. Yep. We simply think that there's some secret behind their success. And the truth is that there is no secret. The only secret is the fact that they did not do it the way everybody else did it. And there are no shortcuts. Yeah. There's no shortcuts. There's no secret. Yeah, you've said it. I don't need to say it. <laughs> and so I, no, no. And so I want to end. No, you usually say it better than I do. <laughs> I, I want to end here briefly by, by talking about what this tells us about the hermeneutic temptation. The hermeneutic temptation is to look at something and to think that there is some secret content to it, that there is something hidden beneath it, that there is something to be discovered or unveiled. And it's precisely to perform the Lacanian interpretation of appearance to say that it's not that a secret is being kept from you, it's that the secret is that nothing is being kept from you. And so the properly Marxist version of that is to say that what we're dealing with is never the content of being rich. It's never the content of being great or whatever. It's not what is the secret of the great mind. It's always the structural premises underlying that content. In other words, the form rather than the content. And the critique of ideology begins and the critique of capitalism begins with moving away from the content and looking into the repressed or disavowed content of the form itself. In other words, to say, not what is the secret being kept from me, but how is the illusion of a secret itself being generated? That is how you resist the hermeneutic temptation, the interpretation to find meaning in something, to look to want to look behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. And so the Lacanian Marxist hermeneutic is always to say, not what is the grape behind the curtain, 
But what is the curtain? What is the illusion that is not being told to me, not mm -hmm. being sold to me? Mm -hmm. It's also why Marxism is called the hermeneutics of suspicion. You're suspicious of something, not because it isn't there. You're suspicious of something because it is there. One of the classic moves of Marxist interpretation isn't to analyze what is being said. It is to analyze everything that is not being said. It's not to simply, quote unquote, deconstruct visible appearances and social relations. It's always to deconstruct the things that aren't being made explicit. This is also why Zizek, for example, has always says that the hermeneutic temptation is that when you see violence in the world, excessive outbursts of subjectivized violence on the news, for example, like, um, I don't know, like a policeman beating a black protester, the point is to actually not just look at that instant of violence, but it's to look at the structural inequity under which such an act could have occurred in the first place. Because of course, if you just look at that moment on the news, you say violence is, this is the classic liberal take, violence is bad, it's bad for a policeman to abuse his force, especially against, you know, an African American, and we need to avoid that situation from happening. If you don't succumb to that hermeneutic temptation, you say the exact opposite. You say, what had to occur structurally and systemically for that protest even to be taking place in which those structural inequities were brought out into their most extreme version through police violence. And so it's not to say, how can we eliminate the violence at the protest? How can we make the protest more peaceful? It's to say, how is the protest emblematic of generations of unacknowledged, disavowed, silenced, structural oppression. That's the Marxist, let's call it like, um, like counterpoint to the hermeneutic temptation to say that the thing that you think has to be analyzed is actually simply a, a symptom. It's symptomatic of something that hasn't been addressed. And that's, that's the basic idea. All right. Thank you guys for watching. It's been wonderful to spend an hour or like 50 minutes with you this morning. <laughs> um, I, if you're still here, I just want you to know, I'm going to be releasing a book next week. This is my pitch. <laughs> it's called The Hermeneutic Temptation. It is a summary of all the classes from the past 10 weeks in a book format. And you can download it on my Patreon. It's going to be released October 31st. I'm going to post like a promotion for it um, today so that you guys have a an idea of what it's going to be like. This class is going to be saved for free on IGTV and YouTube as <laughs> it always saved. is. There's all the no classes secret. are saved. <laughs> all of our classes are open access, available to anybody, anywhere. We're not trying to sell you the secret sauce formula to wisdom. <laughs> anybody can simply participate. <laughs> So you can join the class for free. However, if you are a patron, a big, big thank you to you guys for keeping these classes going. And I hope that you're looking forward to the book just as much as I'm looking forward to releasing it. It's going to be released October 31st called The Hermeneutic Temptation. And you can find all the information on my Patreon. There's a link in my bio or go to www.patreon.com dash Jenaline and Julian. And rest easy, everyone. I will absolutely, <laughs> absolutely save this class to my IGTV so that you can watch it at your own leisure. And of course, as patrons, you can also download the class as an audio file. Plus, we're going to have a bonus discussion starting in five minutes. We're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to go live on Discord to talk about this for another hour. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Jenaline, for being here with me this morning. My pleasure. And we shall see you guys soon. Yeah, uh, or next week. Uh, Same time. Next week. Same yeah. place. Yeah. All right. <laughs> See you guys in five minutes on Discord. <laughs>